So religion is the basis of the abolitionist movement. Uh, still, as I said, most Northerners are not abolitionists. Religion gets really tricky when you do start considering the concept of, of slavery. Uh, many uh, of the abolition societies that are religiously focused do it as that this is against the will of God, that this is the, you know, unchristian, that they're not treating the slaves well. Slave proponents of slavery argue exactly the opposite. And in fact, there are a number of churches. The Methodist Church is a great example. And in 1844, the, Northern, the Methodist Church in the United States splits into northern and southern wings over the issue of slavery. One side believes that it's immoral and wrong. The other side believes that it's completely uh, within keeping with the nature of, of uh, Christianity and religious focus. And so what do they argue? Um, here is a famous pamphlet. It's Nellie Norton, Southern Slavery and the Bible, a, scripture, a scriptural refutation of the principal arguments upon which the abolitionists rely, a vindication of Southern slavery from the Old and New Testaments. There are all kinds of tracts from this time period that make these kinds of arguments. As the, as the abolition movement develops, really gets going in the 1830s, it's small in number, but it's extremely well funded. And it's very, very innovative in terms of the types of marketing that it utilizes to go against slavery. Well, Southerners have to be just as effective in arguing for the institution of slavery, and they largely do it upon religious uh, guidelines. So the defenders of slavery argued that the institution was divine and that it brought Christianity to the heathen from across the ocean. Argued that in the Bible, Abraham had slaves. Ten Commandments noted that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant. New Testament, Paul returned, a runaway slave. Uh, and Jesus never spoke against slavery. These are all arguments uh, from the Bible or from their religious con conceptions of why slavery was in fact not only legal, it is legal constitutionally, but why it is morally justifiable as well. So what happens when the Civil War begins? When the actual Civil War starts, uh, many people, especially in the North, don't believe that it's going to last very long. The first regiments uh, that are put into service uh, in the North are put in service for only three months. That's it. That's how quick they think this war is going to be. Why? Because the North has uh, superior industry, a superior population, and that they are fr they, they have been based their economy and their culture on free labor, meaning they know what it is to work for a living. Those Southerners, those Southerners, they rely on slave labor. And you have to remember, of course, that far less than 10% of Southerners own slaves. It's still a major component of the culture, but most Southerners are, in fact, working for themselves. There are a lot of slaves working also, but they're working. That's not the way Northerners see it. They see the, North, the South as, oh, they're all lazy. They're all sitting around on their plantation porches, uh, being fanned by a slave and drinking mint juleps. And they're never going to be the stout, hardy Yankees of the North and won't be able to fight us. They think the war is going to be over very, very quickly. They didn't account for the Irish. That was the problem, Bob. <laughs> <coughs> So where is the Catholic Church in all of this? The Catholic Church, as I des described with the anti-Catholicism, which is severe in the 1850s, uh, where is the Catholic Church going to fall on the issue of secession? They have to walk an extremely, extremely fine line in this. They don't, they've already been alienated. They don't want to do something that's going to alienate them even further. And so you get this. In May 1861, the Third Provincial Council of Cincinnati tried to clarify the Catholic position on the war, stating that the spirit of the Catholic Church is eminently conservative. And while her ministers rightfully feel a deep and abiding interest in all that concerns the welfare of the country, they do not think it their province to enter the political arena. It further elaborated on the Catholic unity of spirit that recognized no North, no South, no East, no West. If that isn't a fine political statement <laughs> to not get yourself in trouble, um, I don't know what is. They have to be extremely, extremely careful. <clears throat> so what do the Irish and German Catholics and other immigrants do at the beginning of the war? They're as patriotic as the next person. And again, the Ninth Irish is a perfect example of this. In the 1850s, the Irish militia in the state of Connecticut, by law, was actually disbanded. When the war begins, they 
pursue through the General Assembly reinstatement so that they can form uh, their own militia, their own regiment again, so they can fight on behalf of the Union. Why do they want to do this? Uh, many of them have been living in the United States for a period of time now. They are devoted to their new country. They want to show their connection to the United States. They want to show their patriotism. And certainly uh, part of it is that they feel the need to reveal to others, non-Catholics, non-immigrants, that they are in fact as willing to take up arms as anyone else. So there's an element of patriotism that is both, I think, heartfelt for them, but also they want to show and prove that they're as for America and the Union as anyone else is. And it, it, it ends up being a very uh, effective for them. Now, when you get into the history of the 9th Irish Regiment that is, is largely uh, formulated from the New Haven area, uh, they are not treated terribly well at the outset of the war and well into the war. When they arrive at uh, in their southern, um, their first stop in the south at Ship, uh, Ship Island on the Gulf Coast, uh, they are not, they don't have weapons, they're not properly uniformed. Uh, when their commander ultimately does make a big push and get those items when they ultimately make their way up the Mississippi, uh, when we're trying to take uh, Vicksburg on the Mississippi River, the Irish are stuck trying to dig a new channel for the Mississippi River. And the stories of what they go through and, and digging in this uh, just malarial-infested malarial mud along the banks of the Mississippi in uh, triple-digit temperatures, uh, and they're dropping like flies, to the point that um, one of the Irish officers writes in his journal that uh, we don't even have enough men to create a proper burial detail at this point. Uh, this is how poorly the Irish are treated. But they still, uh, they still support the war effort. They still support the Union. And when you get into the midst of the war, and people realize, especially after Bull Run, uh, the North realizes, you know what, this war isn't going to be nearly as quick as we thought it was going to be. Uh, the next regiments are put into service for three years, not for three months. And they realize that this is going to be a long war. And you start getting many in the North, especially from religious groups, who say, you know, maybe it wasn't meant to be a short war. Maybe these setbacks are a message from God. Maybe God is trying to tell us something to make us realize something, to have a greater commitment to this cause, that maybe this is bigger than we had previously thought. And when you get to battles, like the Battle of Antietam, I talked about 23,000 killed and wounded in 12 hours. When you get to Fredericksburg, which happens just a few months later, 18,000 killed and wounded. When you get to Gettysburg, uh, the largest loss over a period of time, the largest loss in any single battle. Uh, Gettysburg occurs over three days. 53,000 killed and wounded. Uh, these kinds of numbers, the, the, the nation has never witnessed anything like this. You can take Antietam, and you can take the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, all the Indian Wars in the West, combine all of the casualty figures, and it doesn't equal tw 12 hours at Antietam. If this kind of loss of life is not going to impact your outlook of what the war is, what the war could potentially be, what it means to you as someone of a faith community, if this is not going to call, either put your faith in question or motivate your faith in some way, I don't know what is.